And then good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we, we are excited, uh, not just for a, a certainly uh, topical discussion, but just we are joined by uh, three sort of pioneers in this space who uh, I know you will appreciate their perspective and their insight and their sort of expertise in uh, where we are today in, in the cannabis world uh, and some of the opportunities that will lie ahead as we sort of uh, traverse these, these uncharted waters. Um, our founders, uh, excuse me, our, our speakers again are going to be Dr. Stephen Dahmer, uh, Chief Medical Officer from Vario Health, um, David Holland, who is the co-founder and president of the New York City Cannabis Association, uh, and Andrew Shriver, who is the president of the Hudson Valley Cannabis Industry Association, and also director of the New York City Cannabis Industry Association. And when I turn it over to our speakers, we're going to have Dr. Dahmer and then Dave and Andrew uh, sort of do their presentations for everyone to hear um, sort of their perspective and their insight. And then we will uh, spend the, the remaining time uh, opening the floor up, having all of you introduce yourselves, certainly have a chance to ask questions, share thoughts and ideas, uh, and is very much the mission of the Westchester Biotech Project. We want to foster collaboration. So your ideas, your thoughts, your, your insight is, is welcomed and encouraged. Uh, and, and our goal, of course, is to try and, and, and leave today with some, some new ideas and thoughts and opportunities to further uh, both our collective works, but also just our, our ideas and, and ways we can help each other. So for those that are just joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, the Westchester Biotech Project uh, is a nonprofit 5013C um, that was founded on the mission of enhancing human health by leading borderless initiatives and practical collaborations inspired by many of you on the call here today, researchers, data scientists, engineers, and the communities that support them. Um, much has, has been asked about the name of the organization, uh, and so I always just like to highlight sort of what our goal is. While uh, we have Westchester in our name, we are actually a international global community. We have supporters and contributors from truly around the globe. Uh, we have Westchester in our name because our mission has always been to highlight the amazing work both in research and science and thought leadership that occurs here in Westchester for the purpose of connecting us with the rest of the global sort of biotech community. Uh, we have biotech in our name, of course, that represents bioscience and technology. We welcome uh, all topics and conversations and individuals, everything from K through 12 to early research, to bench, to founders, uh, right through patient care, and again, all that support them. Uh, and of course, project, it's because we didn't know what else to call it. So we thought that was a great way to sort of highlight what our mission was and bringing everybody together. This obviously is a, a mission that Joanne and I embarked on five years ago, uh, but our successes are, are not ours, it, or certainly not ours alone. And we credit much of what we have done and accomplished, including today, uh, to all of our supporters and contributors. Uh, and this slide here represents not even all of them, just a, 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 a representative sample of the companies, the organizations who have stepped up and provided uh, resources, contributions, leadership. And we certainly welcome anyone who feels compelled to figure out how to get their company name up on this slide. But more importantly, should there be a name on this slide that any of you have the opportunity to want to engage with or interact with, we always welcome the opportunity to make connections and to help foster collaboration through those introductions. Two of our sort of big ideas that we are working on right now, and we are really excited about some of the tangible impact that we are in the process of making. Uh, the first is our career consortium uh, helping with a um, laboratory certificate program, helping try and uh, uh, design programming in the early grades up through the post-doctorate years. Uh, and we've recognized and identified, thanks in a large part to the feedback from our community, opportunities where there is a need for certain types of skills and certain types of support. And that is something that we are thrilled to be contributing to, helping to help build sort of the workforce of tomorrow. 
Our other big idea that we are just thrilled about is the Westchester Data Analytics Hub. We have a framework in place whereby we believe through population health and big data and some of our partners, we are in a position to be the sort of epicenter of bringing together partners from academia to uh, nonprofit university, universities, to the private sector and everyone in between to come up with ways with which to address some of the big challenges that face us today through data analytics. And again, we've recognized and identified some areas in which we know we can deliver value. Uh, and we are very excited to, to push forward on that and certainly welcome anyone who might wanna get involved on that front as well. So today, the cannabis update, and it certainly is a, a topical um, a conversation today. Uh, and certainly if anyone's paying attention, it is headline grabbing and been in the news. But I can tell you firsthand, uh, the folks that you're going to hear from today did not just show up when it became the sexy popular thing to do. These are the folks who've been doing the, 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 the hard work, uh, the, the, the sweat and the labor to help push our society, both from a legislative standpoint, from a medical standpoint, from a research standpoint, from a community standpoint, to the point of fully understanding some of the misunderstandings that have been out there, uh, as well as some of the best practices and opportunities that lay ahead. Uh, I, I've known these folks now for, for a number of years and you know, have attended some of their uh, initial and inaugural meetings when it was just a, a handful of true believers. And I'm just really, really excited today to help uh, provide this platform for them to, to sort of tout their message and their insight to even a, a broader community. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce a, a longtime friend of the Westchester Biotech Project, a, a, a speaker, a, a contributor, someone who, again, we, we are proud and honored to call a friend, but Dr. Stephen Dahmer. Uh, I, I think the, 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 the one title that he goes by um, generally is Chief Medical Officer of Vireo Health, uh, but as you will hear, his involvement, his roles, his contributions uh, run a very, very broad and wide gamut. Uh, and his contributions to uh, the, the medical research of cannabis are, are almost unparalleled. So with that, I welcome Dr. Dahmer and the floor is all yours. Thank you, Michael, uh, Joanne. It's always just such a pleasure to participate and, and I'm just always amazed of the spiraling of connections and ideas that come from these meetings. So I'm just real happy to be here uh, and I get to focus uh, on what I focus on best, and that is kind of the medical aspects of cannabis. Uh, uh, this is a disclaimer that for five years I've been giving lectures on medical cannabis, primarily to uh, physicians and providers that I hope to remove shortly. I'm tired of uh, prefacing every lecture that I give with this. Uh, a Schedule one substance, again, uh, I'll get off a of soapbox quickly, but just is not uh, congruent with this, uh, with, with medical cannabis. We'll jump right into it. Uh, introductions uh, were already done. One of the biggest things that interested me, uh, apart from my background in plant medicine related to cannabis, is when I first entered the space, and unfortunately, it's still still true to this day. Is you know, we'll talk a little bit later, but you know, estimates of 4.5 million Americans in state legal medical cannabis program that still will show up at a dispensary um, and say I have chronic pain. And it's akin to sending them to aisle five and saying, hey, one of these cereals is pretty good for your chronic pain. Uh, start low and go slow and, you know, we wish you luck. Um, and it just really didn't make any sense to me as a physician that if we are going to treat this as medicine and, and Vero Health had its kind of uh, foundation in medical states, we have certainly since expanded from then. But we need to, we have a duty, right, to give people a little bit better uh, chance at understanding uh, this intricate and interesting and fascinating plant. And again, this is something that whether you're in business or in medicine or any realm, and, and Michael, I'm very pleased to hear that data is a focus for the Westchester Biotech uh, uh, Project. And I wanna talk more about that in the future, but you know, to measure is to know. And, and really medicine, this is, is really held uh, to, to the highest regard, especially in evidence-based medicine. And probably one of the biggest criticisms of cannabis is that it's lacking research. If you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And we certainly have a lot of room for improvement the other big argument, you know, I, I kind of hear against uh, research is, well, people are just getting high, right? Uh, they're just uh, to have some fun, especially with these adult use markets and, and uh, recreational moving forward in many states. 
as it will be in, in New York. And, you know, from really serving the front lines of medical cannabis through our dispensaries, we've now served uh, over 100,000 unique patients. Uh, I can attest to that even in an adult use market, patient, patients, people are not coming here to get high. And this is a fantastic study done by Marcus Pock. Huber was um, a physician at, previously at Montefiore, a very close collaborator of ours. This is looking at a thousand adult use only respondents. So this is not a medical market, right? This is not a medical state in terms of Colorado. And in the, of those a thousand adult use respondents, 65% uh, are taking to relieve pain, 74% uh, taking to promote sleep. So as we move right from this kind of medical to an adult use, there's this huge gray area that a lot of us just kind of lump into wellness. Wellness still needs guidance. Wellness still needs data. Wellness still needs uh, research to help guide with this complicated plant. And you know, again, there's a research uh, study that I like to quote quite a bit that calls cannabis the plant of a thousand one molecules. This is not an easy medicine to understand. And, and in our Western medical paradigm, we generally pull out a single constituent, which we already did with cannabis, right? We have synthetic THC, which has been FDA approved since 1985. And I can write a prescription for, that is one of 800 plus, or as the article alludes to 1,001 constituents in this plant that makes it so complicated. This is not one drug, and it's really one of my pet peeves that, oh, cannabis is this, cannabis is that. What are you talking about when you say cannabis? We can have a high CBD or even almost pure CBD product like Epidiolex, which is also FDA approved. We have a synthetic THC only, and there's a million shades in between. And so one of the challenges with cannabis is really deciphering what are we talking about and giving some precision to the medicine. Research has not been at the forefront for cannabis. Uh, specifically related to potential benefits of the plant. We have uh, the NIDA uh, through the NIH has given some estimates, you know, close to a billion dollars. Some would say that dollar amount is less, but mainly to study the negative impacts of cannabis, whereas very few dollars have gone to study potential benefits. And for those that are in the industry, like myself, uh, that have an earnest uh, uh, desire to better study this plant, there are many barriers in our way. Here I'm just uh, kind of listing a couple. Number one, this is not your typical medicine. And again, not only the 1,001 constituents of this, in the history of the FDA, there have been two botanicals that have gone through the botanical drug path. It's a very difficult path because it, the, the plants are so complicated and oftentimes deemed uh, dirty. Not only that, but in the market uh, currently, you know, not just New York, but if you look at uh, California, especially or Colorado, we're talking tens of thousands of SKUs from, you know, different delivery forms, nasal to patch to topical to gel to soft gel, you, you name it, there is a delivery form that exists. Each one of these, you know, in a medical realm will be treated as a different medicine. If we're utilizing any significant amount of THC makes it very difficult to blind because we're dealing with a psychoactive substance, immediately somebody that might be impacted by THC, oh, you know, I know what's going on here. I feel something different. The majority of research has been very, you know, has been poor study design or criticized for not having enough participants or being too short of duration. Um, the majority, as I, I mentioned before, of the study and research and dollars have been gone to going to study harm and most of the research, because those dollars generally favor only one DEA license that's been allowed to move forward. And there have been a few exceptions to that, but that really is Ole Miss, uh, which there are many criticisms that the bud and flower uh, uh, that comes from Ole Miss is not representative of what patients are using in many of the markets today. And, you know, really the, the, the big killer, which is it's a Schedule One substance. And, and I know that We'll discuss this a little bit more, but that kind of crux between uh, FDA approval and an IND process mixed with a DEA license that allows uh, uh, interventional trial to move forward really is a catch-22 that makes it near impossible. And I think we might talk about a couple uh, research uh, projects utilizing Ole Miss uh, flower that have gone through, but for uh, products that patients are currently using in the market makes it near impossible. And I, I love to throw this slide up here because one, you know, we talk about the complexity of the plant, you know, since we have THC and now CBD that are available, sometimes even insurance covered, I can write a prescription and you don't have to jump through 15 hoops. Why the heck are, are all these people going to uh, uh, the markets, right, where we have a, a plant uh, product available that is cannabis? And, and there is this idea 
that is highly debated, right, on both sides of an entourage effect. I am obviously a proponent, uh, just because of my position, uh, that this plant and the many constituents it offers has a softer impact on our human physiology than if we just pull out one of those and synthesize that or supersize that. And not only could it potentially uh, potentiate the therapeutic effect, but also could mitigate side effects. And there is some preliminary evidence to that, but much debated, um, but also potentially a reason why so many people gravitate to uh, uh, state legal markets. Research is exploding. Unfortunately, again, these are not products that most patients in the United States are using. And, and for me, that's just such a huge disconnect. And, and there just really is nothing logical about the approach that we're taking. And, you know, truly feel we're on the precipice of change, which I know we'll discuss a little bit more on this panel. Um, I do want to just talk about a couple things that we have going in-house. And these are the things that we have been allowed to do within the current laws. And, and really, this is uh, thanks to the tremendous team at, at Montefiore Medical Center. And I saw, Joanne, you guys have uh, Albert Einstein College of, Med College of Medicine. Dr. Chinasso Cunningham has really spearheaded these efforts. One is an NIH grant, a $3.8 million grant, looking uh, at adults with chronic pain um, going through the New York program. So kind of a, a longitudinal observational. Let's just observe people going through the program in a naturalistic setting with multiple um, questionnaires, validated questionnaires, multiple check-in points, uh, statisticians following this, you know, a study that really has been determined to have significant number of participants to re reach that statistical significance. And this is really the best we can kind of do in, in the state of affairs is this robust longitudinal observational study. And, and you'll see 250 adults. I sometimes joke this is one of the few occasions where NIH is giving money that might actually show some benefit to cannabis. And, and again, we don't want to jump the gun on, on any conclusions. But the other thing about these is, you know, most companies don't care about this. And, and I say most maybe as a generalization, but this is, as you can see, a lot of money. We we're lucky to, to work with Monty on a grant with this. It's a lot of time. It'll probably take three years before anything comes of this. And the market is moving so quickly in adult use, who cares about research when the dollars are, you know, the iPhone line outside the dispensary in an adult use market. Um, but again, an excellent uh, uh, example of, of, of ways to get better answers in that cereal box aisle uh, and, and that's just one. Uh, Dr. Chanasso Cunningham, you know, had the brilliant idea of let's go after the gold standard. And evidence-based medicine truly has a hierarchy of what is good, better, and best research. The ideal research, you know, for any medicine is going to be the randomized double-blind control trial, which, as I mentioned before, is unfortunately impossible to do in the United States if you're going to utilize your own product. I, I'll be real frank, I've, I've put so much work into, into Vireo and, and, and the heart and soul that we put into the cannabis industry. I wanted to truly study our products because on a daily basis, we are consulting patients on the utilization of our products. And so uh, Dr. Cunningham had the brilliant idea of let's not randomize to the product, which we wouldn't be allowed to do. We'd never make it through the IND process with uh, DEA approval on the other side. So she had the brilliant idea, we're randomizing to a voucher. And we know that the, probably one of the biggest issues for our patients in a medical market is cost. On top of chronic illnesses, on top of their already exorbitant medical costs, we have to pay for this out of pocket. So we, uh, you know, IRB approval, went through the entire consenting process, a patient gets randomized to receive one of our four blinded products at a, a drastic discount, uh, you know, a dollar for a bottle, and they get reimbursed for participating in the study. So it, it, essentially, they get products for free. And they don't know if they're getting a higher THC, which we call our yellow, we have a spectrum, it still has CBD, it's based on the whole plant, or they're getting our green, which is a one-to-one -one ratio THC CBD, or they're getting our indigo, which is a, a high CBD, lower THC, or they're getting a placebo, which we created ourselves, worked with our Department of Health, the New York State Department of Health, which was a fantastic partner. It also gets third party tested, but patients are actually in this trial receiving a placebo. Um, and so this is the first time we're actually measuring, but still people don't know. There's a whole you know, group, oh, well, CBD is great for pain. No, THC is great for pain. No, we still don't even know which one of these formulations is best. And one of the things I like about this uh, the most is that, we are uh, also followed it, following the titration with very closely validated measures. 
So we're looking at not only their pain and the intensity of their pain, but their satisfaction with the medicine, including adverse events, to help decide, oh, you go up one soft gel, or you go down one soft gel, or you stay the same. So we're closely monitoring dose with hopes of not only identifying which of these arms might be best at treating chronic pain, minimizing adverse events, and even decreasing opioid use, but at what dose. Uh, so just real, real exciting stuff that's moving forward. And uh, just give credit to the amazing minds that come together. <laughs> I say water finds its way when there's so many blockades, um, you know, to find a, a way to still go about and try to get better answers for our patients. And I'll just mention real quick, and we've talked about this before uh, with Westchester Biotech as well, and that is, you know, the randomized uh, double-blind clinical trial is just the ideal study. But what I'm very excited about cannabis is, again, we're sitting on 100,000 unique patients that have been utilizing our product. Big data certainly could have a very strong role in this idea of real-world evidence. We not only have been collecting the data on those patients, in Minnesota, all patients are required to fill out questionnaires on potentially efficacy and adverse events. We've had a 24 seven pharmacovigilance program since day zero on every one of those 100,000 plus patients where we're monitoring and capturing adverse events. And this we're hoping, as you see that mountain can be pretty big, it will be dependent on FDA, how much they allow this on that track on the way to, to botanical drug. But we certainly hope that this could be a robust supportive mechanism for some of these trials that we're also doing. Um, and just real exciting, you know, that again, this is, cannabis is, is incredibly backwards in that, you know, there isn't FDA approval and, and we have this many patients utilizing the medicine um, and it not being FDA approved. And I'll just give mention of this. Uh, we are also an, about to launch an app, uh, again, very user-friendly and engaging community to really capture validated measures specific to chronic pain. We are gonna copy and paste this platform because as we well know, Insomnia is also a common condition, you know, potentially anxiety, uh, any other condition that we want to, to have this app that can collect that real uh, world evidence, that real world data to support very specific conditions. Because that's the other challenge with cannabis are the innumerous conditions that are being treated with the, uh, with the plant. So real quick, you know, in summary, 4.5 4 million, and we know this number is so much bigger than that. And I'm constantly changing this slide as the number is increasing. The majority of them, even in adult use market, are treating some symptom or condition. Um, and I feel strongly that that is true. We deserve better guidance than start low, go slow. And despite the cost and the so many barriers, we need to really invest and support you know, the high quality research. Cannabis has been used as a medicine for 5,000 plus years, but it's complicated. Uh, you know, the different forms, types, conditions, delivery forms. Yet, with everything that's occurred, we still gravitate to this plant for some reason. And, and I, I dream someday of a head-to-head -head trial, even of a synthetic THC versus kind of a whole plant compound. And there have been some hints at that, but would love to see that, which in my opinion, could potentially be a paradigm shift for medicine. Um, this is not the only uh, plant medicine that has a potential for entourage effect. There is an argument, it's very, very highly debated, but for this entourage effect, it would be great to have better, uh, higher quality research to either suss that out, is it true or not? It's extremely difficult to do this research uh, for products in market right now, but so exciting. And, and, and Michael, as you hinted at, we, we've been discussing this for five years. I can't believe, you know, and I stand on the backs of giants of, of how many came before me, really laid the groundwork and how quickly this is moving. Societal, political, you know, uh, legal, medical. I mean, I think uh, last I saw, it, it might be 91% of Americans that are favoring uh, medical cannabis, and, and, and I, th I think I saw a joke that there are more that believe in uh, Bigfoot than uh, are against cannabis. I'll leave it there and, and pass it to the next speaker, uh, but uh, really appreciate the time and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Stephen. And, you know, I'm always amazed when I hear you speak about how long you've been at this and the hurdles that you've had to sort of navigate and overcome to, to achieve all this. And then at the same time, oh, right here in our backyard, some of this is going on. And I, I bet there's, there's a number of people here who did not realize that, you know, Montefiore and Albert Einstein are participating here. I did have just one question. So as the states have started to come along with understanding the benefits of, of, of more realistic sort of uh, legislation, which we'll hear from in a moment here, is the FDA sort of following along or is that just going to be a whole separate battle for you unrelated to the state level? 
Yeah, that, I, I suspect, I mean, obviously the state level will put some pressure in, and that's what I hear, right, through the forest already is that that pressure is, you know, putting some pressure because the FDA really has a job to protect all of us. And when the numbers are going up so much, I think there's increasing pressure and CBD, we certainly see this. I think we'll see more in the realm of THC as well. I think that there is pressure. I, I don't have confirmation of that. We are in direct discussions with the FDA and trying to you know, navigate that process. You know, ideally for me, I'm excited about CBD. I truly do think that a large part, especially the pain relieving potential of cannabis comes from THC. And whether 0.3% is significant enough or, and, you know, I think we'll find out from the research we're doing, but I would love to see, you know, some opening to, to actually studying some C, uh, THC component in the plant as well. Got it. Well, we're also going to circle back with you on that big data project. Maybe we can help push that, that agenda forward. So thank you again, Stephen. Uh, so next again, it is my pleasure to introduce two other friends uh, to the Westchester Biotech Project. Uh, Dave Holland, co-founder and president of the New York City Cannabis Association, uh, who, if, if you know, I, I, every chance I get, I'm, I'm going to listen to him to him talk. It's he's got just an amazing story, sort of the Forrest Gump of the cannabis uh, legislation world. Uh, he's been there. He's, he's been at, at, at every sort of uh, meaningful point. Uh, and 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 a good friend, local friend here, Andrew Shriver, uh, president Hudson Valley Cannabis Industry Association and director of the New York City Cannabis Industry Association. Who, uh, many of you may know just from his work here from our uh, Cuddy and Fader local firm. I don't know if we're allowed to mention their name in this context, uh, but just really uh, amazing work. And, and gentlemen, I'm turned over to you and uh, let you take it from here. Well, uh, th thank you so much. Uh, it's um, I'll kick it off and 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 then turn it over to Forrest to to bring us home. Uh, but I, I want to I want to thank Stephen for an excellent presentation. Uh, I learn every time I get to attend one of these events. I'm sure, and I know we all do. And uh, beyond which, you also have a gift for a perfect seg, right? Because we talked about being on the precipice of change. Uh, Dave and I are going to talk a little bit about what that change looks like, kind of why it came about. Also, um, let me just tell you a few words about I guess what got uh, Dave and I together. I was. Uh, you know, in, in that capacity of my firm, which is, which has gotten its name out. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I was uh, up in Albany on a lobby day and Dave and I ran into each other and kind of found each other and sort of figured we knew each other from a lost life. And anyway, we got to talking about, um, you, you know, the state of things. And this was a few years back when we were looking down, down, you know, toward the future. And what we had realized was that while there's a lot of advocacy groups out there, uh, there hadn't been a lot of planning for what would happen once legalization occurred. And what would the industry look like? So, um, you know, David had been in conversations with other people. And, and long story short is we, we had founded the New York City and Hudson Valley Cannabis Industry Associations to fill that, that gap and to make sure that if there's going to be a rollout of a legal market, it's done as responsibly as possible, as receptive to community needs as possible, uh, but also as, as, you know, truthful as possible in terms of what the plant's about, what, you know, and what led to... Uh, the stigmatization of the plant, given that, as Stephen said, it's been 5,000 plus years that it's had some form of use, including adult use beyond uh, medical. And that's proven back. Uh, the, the earliest date I have in that is 2,000 years. So you'll have to take the other 3,000 years uh, on faith, I guess. Um, so the mission of our associations is to basically be a hub for anybody who's interested in the industry to help each other figure out how to help the industry grow responsibly. Um, and by doing that, we formulate critical policy. Uh, we've actually, uh, if you go to our website, uh, hbcia.org, free Westchester people, nyccia.org, it'll take you to the same place. But you'll see, if you scroll down a few uh, bits on the homepage, you'll see some policy pieces that we've put out over the past year, all of which have gone to the legislature, and many of which are actually reflected in what happened with the statute. We're really glad to see that. Um, and, and you'll see that that work is the product of committees that we put together, which means that anybody who's interested can get together and, and the only, the only uh, by becoming a member, the only, the only criteria to be on a committee is that you are a member. Uh, and then we put together these policy statements about what would make for the right marketplace. How do you get the balance right uh, economically, you know, community needs um, and breaking down some of the myths. What we wanna do here is just kind of give people a very broad overview of the state of affairs. Um, I'm gonna talk just very generally about where we stand now, a little bit about the history that led us to this point, uh, which is important for everybody to know, uh, and also talk about a couple of myths, uh, breaking down some, a couple of stigmas, and I'll let you know also what the opportunities are in the new statute. Um, my charge is to try to do that in 10 minutes or less, and I think I just took a minute and a half, so 
let me get right into it. Where are we now? Uh, you stole my thunder, Stephen. Yes, the number according to a Pew Research poll the other day is 91% of the nation favors a legalization of either medical or adult uh, use cannabis. We are now at a point where 37 states have some form of legal cannabis. Um, that's 75% of the country. Um, and we now are at 18 states uh, with uh, New Mexico and, and Virginia following New York very quickly after its legalization just at the end of March. Um, let me get into what brought New York to the point of legalization. There are two key priority points uh, that, are, that are at stake here. Number one is it is a huge revenue generator to create a new marketplace. And that's not just tax revenues, that's um, business stimulation, economy stimulation, and part and parcel of that. And one of the key facets of the statute is that it is designed to promote social equity and importantly, redress disproportionate impact of the criminalization of people from communities of color. According to a Vox headline from a couple of years ago, the arrest rate for people of color compared to whites for possession of marijuana was eight to one despite the fact that there's a roughly 50-50 rate of usage. Um, so the statute was passed in huge part to redress that. And that means specifically prioritizing social equity applicants and letting those people who are part of now what's called the legacy market, the illicit market, have an opportunity to come in and create the new market. That's an essential part of the plan because if you don't do that, you wind up like a situation with California where you have a legacy market that wasn't invited in and they continue to exist and undercut uh, the legal market. So that's an important policy point. At present, we're at a point where nearly 139 million Americans are living in a state where adult use is now legal. Um, federal law is inching closer to that. The House of Representatives last year passed the Moore Act that would decriminalize it nationally. Uh, they've just, re that hasn't gone to the Senate or passed the Senate uh, or been taken up yet there. And the House more recently, uh, last week, repassed for the fourth time the SAFE Act, which would allow banking to take place on a state level basis for those states that have legal programs. I should mention one of the sponsors of the Moore Act was now Vice President Harris. So, you know, there, there's a lot of reason to think that this is going to become a nationally legal substance uh, probably sooner than later. Also, take into account that Canada has legalized a couple of years ago, and Mexico just voted to legalize. Um, state of affairs nationally, as of 2020, there were $18.3 billion in recorded US revenues. Uh, a colleague of ours, Ruben Lindo, who's on the board of directors of the Hudson Valley so, uh, Cannabis Industry Association, uh, noted the other day that um, the, the rough statistic is that we're still at about 17% of revenues being legally accounted for, uh, with the remainder still to be, you know, still to come online in terms of legal sales. So that's a challenge, and that's something that we want to focus on. Um, there's also been a 71% increase in year-over-year -year sales uh, between the last two years. Um, and that leads to the question, well, if cannabis is so popular now, you know, why was it prohibited in the first place, particularly since it was around for 5,000 years up until roughly the last 90? Um, this is really important for people who are interested in this as a marketplace because there is so much misinformation that's been disseminated. And I want to get into the reasons why. Very, very early on. Uh, it, at the end of alcohol prohibition, the person who was in charge of that, the predecessor leader of, uh, to, to what is now the DEA, a man named Harry Anslinger, uh, was in charge of alcohol prohibition enforcement. Then that ended. Up until that point, he had been quoted as, no as noting that cannabis was a relatively innocuous substance, for example, didn't lead to violent behavior. After prohibition ended, uh, there became a big push by him to move in the direction of demonizing cannabis. Uh, and he started with putting out statements unsupported, all of it because it can't be supported, talking about how it leads to violent behavior, for example. And then he really, really upped the ante. Um, and what happened was he started to circulate the phrase marijuana instead of cannabis, which was a, a, a alluding to Mexican slang um, because there was a huge anti-Mexican um, sentiment at the time. And then it, of course, as 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 we now know, as 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 we know from. 90 years of, of tortured history, it extended into race issues. And that came from the head of the predecessor to the DEA who held that office from the 30s until 1961. And he is quoted as saying, and I apologize for what I'm about to quote to you because it is deeply disturbing, but it's an important part of understanding why everything that's brought us to now was based on false information. Uh, so here's a quote from Harry Anslinger. 
There are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the US and most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz, and swing result from marijuana use. This marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and any others. And he was also quoted as saying, reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. I always, you know, I, I, I can never get through in the talks that we have reading those quotes without choking on them. But the fact of the matter is that that was the status of affairs. And it didn't just last for his reign. It was actually brought on and extended after his reign ended nine years later when the Nixon administration decided to classify it as a class one controlled substance. And why did that happen? Well, we know, a little bit of background on that. First, Nixon said, I want a person named Schaefer to form a commission that's going to give me a reason to schedule it as a class one narcotic. Schaefer came back with the opposite findings that Nixon was looking for. He said it didn't lead to violent behavior. Uh, no significant physical, biochemical, or mental abnormalities can be attributed solely to its use. The weight of the evidence, it doesn't cause violent or aggressive behavior. This is direct quotes from those findings. Nixon ignored it. Why did he keep it schedule one? This is, this is now from Nixon's chief advisor, John Ehrlichman, quoted in 1994, telling Harper's the following. Number one. The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. And another quote, we could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So 90 years of complete myth-making that all of us were taught from elementary school on. A couple of things to know about breaking up those myths for people. If you want to have honest conversations, then acknowledge what the truths are and what we've been told as fiction. I'm going to give a few examples of that. Um, and by the way, based on these myths, it's worth keeping in mind that lives have been ruined. Families are separated. Fathers, uh, mothers are, uh, you know, are denied custody, have been denied custody based on their cannabis use, despite the fact that the other spouse might have had four martinis the night before that court appearance. Consider that, right? It's also, you know, it's, it's, it's in charge of people's parole. People have lost their jobs. And there's been a grossly disproportionate impact in terms of arrests and, and what it's done to minorities. In other words, Nixon succeeded in his mission. So a couple of examples. Cannabis leads to aggressive behavior. That was actually negated by Nixon's own Schaefer Commission. Uh, number of people who can die from an overdose on cannabis, and I'm sure doc, uh, Dr. Dahmer will back me up, zero. Um, gateway drug theory. The DEA took down that theory from its website in 2017. That was when the Drug Policy Alliance found that the vast majority of people who use marijuana do not go on to use other illicit drugs. Newsweek in 2020 on, on that pointed out that medically CBD is an element of the plant that actually holds the ability to reverse the effects of addiction by minimizing cravings. One of the biggest myths, cannabis is more dangerous than alcohol. Ask a bartender if, if someone's been drinking up until 3 a.m. and they start getting into an argument, what's going to happen, right? Compare it to, you know, the joke goes, compare it to people who have been using cannabis up until that time, it's going to get into a heated policy debate or they'll form a band, you know. But I'm sh had to say it. Um, comparative costs of alcohol. This is what it can lead to. Statistics from the CDC. High blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, liver disease, digestive problems, cancer of the breast, mouth, throat, esophagus, liver, and colon. And it does lead to violent behavior. In contrast, we already know the medical applications. Uh, we've talked about them a little bit, but just to give a short list, Alzheimer's, appetite loss, cancer, Crohn's disease, immune, immune system diseases, eating disorders, epilepsy, glaucoma, mental health conditions, uh, PTSD, schizophrenia, muscle spasms, nausea, pain, seizures. Just, and, and I'm sure that that's actually just not the entire list. And then where, by contrast, you have zero deaths per day as a result of cannabis use, according to the CDC, Excessive, and this is a quote, excessive alcohol use is responsible for more than 95,000 deaths in the United States each year, or 261 deaths per day. These deaths shorten the lives of those who die by an average of almost 29 years for a total of 2.8 million years of potential life lost. It is a leading cause of preventable death in the United States and cost the nation $249 billion in 2010, according to the CDC. So 
the point is that it, it's not to put down alcohol use, everything done in moderation and responsibly, it's a free society and we're not advocating for that. But we are looking to say that anybody who's had a glass of wine who will continue to shun people who support cannabis use need to understand the facts. And many times when they understand those facts, they can move past them and, and, and it actually opens up a lot of doors. So what we're really looking to do is shine light on the truth. It's really kind of what we stand for. And once we get that done, um, we actually find that we're able to move along uh, to help people, you know, understand that this is actually a great opportunity. That leads me to one last thing. I'm a little bit over my time, and, and I know that Dave's got a lot of good things to talk about, uh, but I did want to let people know what specific business opportunities are presented by the now enacted legislation. In terms of licenses, uh, there's going to be licenses for, uh, and this is under adult use, for cultivation, for processing, uh, for a cooperative model where people can grow together and then sell to retail facilities, for distribution, for retail dispensary, for micro businesses, which is like a mini vineyard uh, uh, kind of thing where you can uh, you know grow it and sell it, not use it on premises, but there is something separate for uh, on-site consumption. There's a license for delivery, license for nursery, and as I mentioned, uh, adult use on cons on-site consumption. So there will be the equivalent of an Amsterdam coffee house, whether or not they will be serving coffee will remain to be determined. That, that's gonna happen at the regulatory stage. Um, in addition to that, uh, that's, that's for those businesses that are going to be touching the plant, but there are plenty of ancillary market opportunities because you are effectively starting a new economic ecosystem in the state. And I'll just a few examples of ancillary opportunities would be um, HVAC installers for proper installation in on-site growth and dispensaries, transportation for distribution, uh, lab testing facilities in order to ensure product quality, labeling, packaging, child-proof packaging, construction, commercial real estate brokers, landlords for dispensaries, growth facilities, labs, distribution centers, um, security, it's going to be a huge component, security services, warehouse space for indoor growth facilities. Um, and just as importantly, it also promotes growth for surrounding businesses and promotes tourism, beyond which there are local benefits, which is that on a locality basis for lo those localities where the business is generated, 3% of the revenues go toward that locality and 1% goes to the county. Um, so it, there's a ton of opportunity, very exciting time. That was probably two hours worth of information in roughly 12 minutes. So I, I apologize if it was too much at once, but I wanted to make sure that we made this as fulsome as possible. Uh, and now on to what I consider the main event, my colleague, Dave Holland. Well, well thank you, yeah, Andrew. And I really appreciate it. And you did cover tremendous ground in a short time and did it so well. And, and, and in honor of being Forrest Gump, I guess I got to start out saying, uh, cannabis scientific research is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And that is actually the truth because one of the biggest victims after we get through all the different prohibition fatalities and, and detriments that have happened to communities and individuals, as Andrew pointed out, is science. Uh, and ultimately, as Andrew said, you know, sunshine being the best disinfectant, truth being light. The one thing that has been very concerted is forever the government monopoly on cannabis, cannabis research, and the opportunities to go about doing that. So for some, many of you probably already know, but just to start, the Controlled Substances Act in 1970 set the Schedule One status of cannabis, which put it there with PCP, heroin, LSD, and a few other fine drugs. Um, the reason why it was put there was only to be temporary, and the Schaefer Commission, in fact, said it doesn't belong there, but nonetheless, Nixon kept it because he had his own political agenda, which was to keep the politics of science out of being able to have a unifying force within the counterculture that was existing at the time. So under Schedule One status, there are basically three criteria that it, it claims that it has no scientific validity in terms of medical application. Uh, it has a high risk of abuse, and there's no set of circumstances under which controlled scientific research could take place. That is and has been the constant status of cannabis, even though we know that that's not the real case. Um, but the only research that has continued on since 1970 is actually under Ole Miss in the Mississippi University system, where they have the same plantation planting the same plants, the same strain, the same lousy crap from 50 years ago, that is still what they conduct all scientific or sanctioned scientific experimentation on. And so as a good doctor just proved, you know, there are so many different strains that are cultivated for so many different potential cannabinoid effects and research possibility. And yet that is completely squelched 
And so politics have weaponized itself against your exploration and ability to be able to uh, utilize cannabis as a research facility and a medical application. And that is shameful. Um, under the Controlled Substances Act, uh, just so you know, there, it can be challenged either, generally it's challenged by the petition process where you file a petition with the FDA saying, we think it should be rescheduled. And, and several efforts have taken place in that regard. Uh, in starting in 1976, Normal, the National Organization for Reform of Marijuana Laws, which I head up their New York State chapter, they sued the DEA on that designation of Schedule One, and an administrative law judge named Young found that indeed, um, looking at all the evidence that was extant at that time, there was absolutely no basis to believe that, that cannabis was harmful or belonged in a Schedule One classification, but he felt that it was a political question and therefore he could not go further in terms of ordering a rescheduling. Um, that mantle was taken up again. Uh, more recently, uh, um, several efforts have been made, but more recently, some you may have heard of are Americans for Safe Access and the Coalition to Reschedule Cannabis, which was headed by John Getman. Uh, we tried both in 1999 and then 2002 uh, was the refiling of that petition. And just to give you an idea of what that means, that petition process is not a minor uh, uh, undertaking. It had thousands of pages of anecdotal and international research that had been conducted outside the U.S. system attached and annexed as uh, the scientific basis for seeking that rescheduling. Sadly, it took nine, I'm sorry, it took 10 years and two different applications to a court to compel the DEA to make a determination, which we knew the outcome from the onset. And that had to then, ultimately, the rescheduling application was denied, and it went on to the D.C. Court of Appeals in the Federal Circuit. And they said it's a political question, essentially. We can't do anything about it. And that, again, was in the most recent case that you've heard of, probably Washington versus Sessions, uh, which I was involved in. This in, uh, involved, uh, for the most part, uh, two young children, uh, Jagger, uh, Jagger Cott and um, uh, Alexis Bortel, who were suffering from uh, severe forms of epilepsy, and this was what was keeping them alive from hundreds of seizures a day that they were now getting high level CBD in Colorado uh, that had stabilized them. They had gone now years without any uh, uh, effects or epileptic attacks. The only problem was they had to leave their home state and they were not allowed to leave Colorado and travel like a normal child would in any way, shape, or form, and it threatened their parents' governmental jobs because one of them worked with still on an uh, uh, army base and therefore the child could never visit. So there, there's a lot of craziness that goes with that. And so you can see the squelching of science is real and it's, it's intentional. Um, during that time period, talk about irrational. Um, there is, as, we, the, as Dr. Dahmer pointed out, you know, there are synthetic versions. There's Marinol and Sativex that are in schedule two. Now, why is it that a, a, a synthetic version of THC is scheduled two, and yet the plant-based, where it comes from, and it's derived, and that which has the full spectrum effect, the full entourage, if you will, all the cannabinoids that are supposed to be in a plant unextracted, is schedule one, and is the cause not only to stop science, but to incarcerate millions of people. It's been the devastation of our country and the devastation of our morality by squelching science in this regard. So it's very important to keep in mind now that the movements to keep science going are important and incumbent upon all of you to try to keep that alive because we're watching a change. And while social equity, you're hearing a lot about social equity and social justice for those that have been the downtrodden and the victims of the war on drugs, the biggest victim has been science because it's science was allegedly the justification for those incarcerations and those arrests. So that's a very important thing. Um, so, and most recently, I think some of you may be familiar with the name Dr. Sue Sisley, who started out at University of Arizona, and she's now part of Scott Scottsdale Research Institute. She's got the most recent case challenging the DEA schedule on this because she has been working with uh, the poor victims of the actual wars over in Iraq and Afghanistan, who have come back with terrible traumatic pain injuries, as well as traumatic psychic injury in the form of PTSD. They are uh, people that when I was at high times, when I really got committed to this, you know, I would get calls from uh, people that had come back were Purple Heart um, veterans that were incapable of walking and they were put in VA hospitals and the only solution that was given to them for their suffering 
was to load him up on opioids to the point that they were suicidal. And they found the one phone call and tried to help uh, seek help from me and High Times to see what we could do to guide them through this, which is what really prompted me to um, undertake a number of the different challenges that I put up against the DEA and the FDA designation of Schedule One. So Stu Sisley following in that and, and a woman of, of uh, much greater uh, intellect and ability than I have as a mere litigation lawyer to take up this charge, she found that what was coming out of the Mississippi plantation, if you will, was just crappy, moldy, ineffective marijuana. And, you know, in the meantime, there is so much more out there. And I need to just backtrack to say in 1996, California passed the first medical marijuana law. There are now 37 states, I think, no, 38 states that have medical marijuana in it, all in violation, I might add, of the federal designation of Schedule One that says it has no medical viability. Now you have almost three quarters of the United States saying, oh, I disagree. I want my citizens to be able to enjoy medical cannabis if that gives them some form of relief, um, whatever that may be. So you have a real constitutional crisis out there between what is supposed to be the federal law is supposed to be the supreme law of the land. And most of the states saying, I disagree. Not only do I disagree, I'm the past legislation to run an entire cannabis-based program that is going to uh, under, undermine and actually nullify your uh, uh, federal designation of Schedule One. And the weird thing about it, before I get back to Sue Sisley, the weird thing about it is the federal government has gone out of its way to handcuff itself so it cannot enforce its own laws. So you may have heard about the Cole Memorandum, the Ogden Memorandum that said, don't go at, to federal prosecutors. Conserve your resources. Don't go after those people, those uh, the businesses and those patients that are uh, lawfully abiding by the state medical marijuana laws and, uh, and, you know, hands off. And that has been upheld in Congress and passed spending appropriations measures on top of that guidance from the attorney general's office. So there really is no way for the federal government right now until the expiration of the sunset date on the next uh, spending appropriations bill to actually reassert its supremacy of the Schedule One designation to preempt, if you will, all those state-based medical marijuana programs. So we're sitting in a real anomaly and here's Sue Sisley saying, look, uh, we need to conduct real research with real people that have real symptoms and you're, you're limiting me on a designation base from which I can do a full, you know, be the uh, primary investigator and so forth. You're preventing science from doing what it does to conduct research in this regard. And she has taken on the DEA and that case is still pending. But one of the things she points out is not only the, the hypocrisy of the federal government not enforcing its own law, but still incarcerating people due to the Schedule One designation, which has been the means by which put millions of black and brown uh, Americans and uh, into prisons. But she's pointed out any other drug, including MDMA, LSD, psilocybin, and others, if it's not obtainable from a manufacturer in the United States under which you can conduct scientific research, and which there are, you know, dosage ability-wise, you're able to say, what do 10 micrograms of LSD look like, which is then defeats the third prong of the Schedule One designation. There's no, you can always look outside, as I understand it from her lawsuit, to get that product from a foreign nation if it's not available through our manufacturers. But our, our nation or our federal government and the FDA are not going to permit or allow investigation of foreign cannabis product outside of that which is grown on the Mississippi plantation. So it is, there is no doubt in my mind as I think about it further that there is a um, very viable, uh, it's not a conspiracy, it's an outright uh, campaign of terror and prohibition against scientists saying do not conduct anecdotal experiments, your license could be on the line if you're not part of a medical program like Dr. Dahmer is, and there is, and I, 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 we can all have our own little suspicions as to why that is, but at the end of this, I just want to say that there are ways to challenge this and there are ways the scientific community should continue to bring um, its voice to bear in Congress and in the courtrooms to say we need better, there is better, and you are preventing us from doing it. And that is not only uh, an irrational approach to science, it's an irrational approach to policy because you have 
now in the 38 states, we have 300 million people and some like 220 million live in a legalized state. So that's just to sum it up and just to say that the future is bright for cannabis if we can get more programs like NIH and more programs like we've seen even in psychedelic medicine. Talk about another area where that's a schedule one substance dealing with LSD and psilocybin and ketamine, which is now schedule three. There is research out there and there is opportunity, but it takes a voice and it takes a conversation. And it takes people. Uh, and this is what Andrew and I are committed to as part of the industry association, because science is part of the industry and it is the basis by which policy should be driven, not politics. So uh, I hope that as we move forward and as the Westchester Biotech Group continues to look at these issues, it looks at ways to assert its power because it's the power of the voting booth, if nothing else, that will change this policy because there's absolutely no scientific basis for it to stay or ever have been designated as a Schedule One substance. So with that, uh, I thank you all for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, David. Uh, you know, I don't know if there's any subject matter that is more entangled in every facet and every aspect of our of our society, from political to economical to scientific to racial. It, it, it's 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 fascinating to see how this this stuff, sort of the history of it. And and for those of you who are just hearing some of this history for the first time, you're literally getting the Cliff Notes version of the history. Uh, and, and the quote that, that Andrew uh, shared earlier, uh, just one example of a number of sort of just unbelievable positions and attitudes that existed here in our country not that long ago. So, you know, uh, thank you for, for getting through that, Andrew, and sharing that. Um, I, I have a question for Andrew before we sort of open it up to, to everybody. So at the end of your uh, presentation, you were talking about uh, sort of sharing a number of the different business opportunities uh, that may come about in, in this space. But I'm curious what your thoughts are as to when those opportunities, where are we in the trajectory to say, hey, I'm interested in opening a business. Should I start looking for you know, real estate tomorrow? Should I be applying for my license today? What, where are we in that process? Uh, thanks, Michael. That's an excellent question. Um, and and it's, it's actually, it's a difficult question to answer for two reasons. Right? Number one is you can hurry up and wait, right? You can get all of your resources together and then really not be 100% sure where we're going to be, you know, six months from now uh, in terms of what the pace is. I think you have to kind of reverse engineer it. So let, let's look at what, what's practical and let's look at what's happened in other states that have legalized and how we can actually move faster than those other states now. Um, the, you know, now that the statute's passed, the next thing that happens is that the Office of Cannabis Management and the Cannabis Control Board will create the regulations, right? So statutes define things broadly. Like, for example, there's a lot of social equity components to the statute. Um, how they're going to implement it is actually going to be critical. Uh, so, uh, and, that, and that's one of, of several examples, um, way too many to count here. So that process is probably going to be about a six to nine month process um, to get it right. Um, from there, then it's a matter of them, I think simultaneously they'll be walking and chewing gum in terms of preparing the application process. Uh, and it's not yet set in stone in terms of how they're gonna prioritize how those applications come out. But um, the conventional wisdom is that the current uh, cannabis facilities in the state will have first crack. That's the, the ROs, the medical registered organizations. They're entitled to three licenses each under the statute. The question remains whether that will be three all at once to each of them or one to each and then allow others to come in. We're advocating for the latter. We don't, we don't want there to be an early sort of monopoly footprint, but we do want it. We do recognize that many of them have invested in this market and made it possible to get here now. Toward that end, uh, the, the next step up from our point of view and, and what we're advocating for is that the social equity applicants be the first prioritized licenses. So why is that important? Um, for people who are interested in, in, in pursuing this as a business opportunity, they're going to want to um, start thinking about what's going to be important to the license issuers, right? So it's, and it's not just going to be social equity applicants. It'll also be those applicants who have social equity plans to empower the social equity aspect of the statute. And more specifically, the statute allows for incubator projects, right? So you can have somebody from a community that's been, you know, ravaged by the war on drugs who doesn't have the resources financially, but if there's incubation programs and grants up front, 
then those people now should start making those connections. So if you're interested in getting in, I would really recommend every prospective business owner and entrepreneur to be thinking about that specific subject, because that is a way to, to try to navigate to be one of the early people in. Um, I'm also telling people that now is the time to start planning mechanically for those things that you can get in place, specifically. Um, we don't have the license application in hand yet. We do have medical license applications from New York. We have other applications from adult use, use states that you can use as a model. And the statute specifically says types of information they're going to be looking for. Start pulling it together now. It's sort of like, you know, doing a refi on your house. It's, it's you know, all of a sudden you smack your forehead and say, oh, my God, I have a month of things to pull together. Do it now while we're waiting for the regs to pass, because the objective of any, of any entrepreneur is going to be one of the early entrants to the market. Um, so that that should be done now. People are actually coming to my office, to Dave's office, to consult with us now for purposes of laying out the overall strategy. Is what you want to do is figure out that it's going to take you roughly a year to 18 months to get into the application process from where we are now. You want to have everything ready for that. And beyond that, you have to have your global business plan ready. That includes the social equity component. That also concludes your brick and mortar component. So not only are you thinking about what you're going to lease or own, but where. And the statute does allow for certain communities to opt out. They have a limited window. They have to do it by the end of this year. So, and, and based on the fact that municipalities will get 3% of the revenues from taxes straight to them, there's, there's a lot of good incentives for communities not to opt out, but you want to start conversations now. And that's actually where we and, 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 you know, where the lawyers or consultants come in to sort of help message to the community leaders and check in and say, are you okay with this now? And if they say, no, I'm not okay. Then I asked them for 10 minutes to give the speech I just gave. And a lot of times at the end of that, they might be okay because they go, oh, I didn't know that. Right? Um, so, so, so those are the conversations you want to have now. You, and and it's, it's a good time to start putting together your professional team now. That's the lawyers. That's actually the accounting is going to be difficult. So you got to figure that out. Um, your financing source, your real estate source, and you want to start dealing with municipal officials. It also doesn't hurt to start your messaging to communities where you may be interested, and that means the PTA, right? Have a conversation. This is why a legal market actually protects minors more than, than a legacy market. Um, this is why minors will not be getting a hold of um, stuff that hasn't been lab tested if they do get a hold of it, and why it's going to be harder for them to get into this market, for example. Um, so, you know, the business plan, the real estate component, the checking in with the municipality and the getting the license application materials together. For me, as a, as a lawyer, it's a good news story that I have roughly a 12 to 18 month ramp before my client has to be ready, because I think it may take a good amount of that time. Uh, so the short answer is probably sooner than later. Uh, and now you have the long answer as to why. I love it. I love it. Before we open it up to everyone and I'll give everyone a chance that there are some other great questions in there. I just, just wanted to ask Dave a follow-up question. I'm just curious from your perspective, and by the way, if, if the Forrest Gump moniker is going to stick, I do want credit for that. But <laughs> from, your, from your historical perspective, how much, if any, has the COVID-19 pandemic played a role in furthering the legislation, specifically here in New York, to where we are today? Is this a response economically? Is this a response politically? Or was this going to happen anyway? You know, it's a great question. I, I, I wish I could give you the definitive answer on that. I would say it played a very big factor, right? So this is uh, not only has pandemic caused a devastation to our economy, um, but here is a revenue driver that can come in that is uh, right now the world's largest marketplace exists in New York City. It's entirely untaxed and over a million pounds a year go through New York State entirely untaxed. So that's certainly part of it. But in fairness, um, as Andrew pointed out, with the arrest statistics and what is the clear persecution rather than just the prosecution where they criminalize people rather than a plant, I think the Black Lives Matter movement of the last two years was really a driving force behind all this. Um, I think that when you see what has happened and the communities and how disregarded people of color have been, even in roadside stops that they ended up dead. I think all of those factors, when you start to look at in the million arrests, well, there's been a more than a million arrests in New York City alone, at 87.5% of those being people of color, that's 875,000 people have suffered for needless persecution of something that we know scientifically has no basis being relegated to schedule one. So. I, in answer to your question respectfully, I can't separate my own politics anymore from the real basis for it, but it certainly was a political maneuvering 
um, with all that's going on in New York right now. I thank all of you for all your hard work in this front, all of your time today. Thank you all so much. Have a great evening. Thank you.